Hi, I'm Tom Marino. At Cone Resnick, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Wells Fargo, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, making healthcare work, the New Jersey Education Association, working for great public schools for every child, New Jersey Council of County Colleges, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and banking under the principle of stewardship. PSENG, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. And by Verizon Communications. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. I want to introduce you to one of the most talented teachers we've ever had. Thank you. She's uh, Lisa Schustak, an art teacher at Redwood Elementary School in West Orange, New Jersey, part of our classroom close-up initiative in cooperation with the NJA. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Steve. We're about to see a clip from the classroom close-up series uh, that airs on our uh, station, public, public television station here in New Jersey, NJTV. Uh, check it out. This is uh, part of an interesting initiative called GEO, Global Exploration Educators Organization, real quickly, which is? Uh, a travel program for educators. Um, they have teachers from all over the country traveling to different places, um, and it's a fabulous program. And uh, this was a trip that you took to Turkey? Yes. And the whole idea is to come up with great ideas from traveling, bringing it back into the classroom. This is from Classroom Close Up, NJEA. Great stuff. Check it out. The project that we're going to be working on today was inspired by my travels. I went to Turkey this summer. Redwood Elementary art teacher Lisa Schustak has a passion for travel. For the past three years, she's trekked around the world with global exploration for educators. One of her goals? To inspire her students to gain a greater appreciation for art and travel. Art from around the world is so different and so visually interesting to me that I love to bring it back for my students. I often think of them when I'm away and how I can incorporate these things into lessons. Right. These are really um, pretty, fun, and inspirational for our art project. This morning, her second graders are about to make yes. evil eyes, a Turkish symbol for good luck. Do people speak English in Turkey? Oh, that's a great question. A lot of people spoke English and they also speak Turkish. I think this is cool because we get to paint it and it looks better painting than drawing. It's kind of cool because it has like different kind of colors and I like lots of colors. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Look how many are on this one. This afternoon, she teaches her fourth graders about the symmetrical designs she saw in Turkey. This was inspired by the Turkish motifs, the Turkish designs. As you can see in a lot of their buildings, they have uh, radial symmetrical designs. These are all from Turkey, all of these colored little cards. I have been working with a radial symmetrical design with the fourth graders, and that's what inspired me to incorporate creating a tile based on different Turkish motifs that I brought back. Whenever she goes somewhere, she gets an idea and then tells us about it, and so it's like we're learning a lesson all about the place. I saw an article about teachers who had traveled, and I thought, wow, I would like to do that. The thought of traveling with other teachers and having that common bond immediately was just perfect for me. We visit schools in these other countries, and so going in and to see classrooms is very, very fascinating. 
to see um, how education is in other countries. Did you guys see this? No. Ooh. Whoa. <laughs> Do you like that? 15 a lot of eyes on it. Yeah. That thing could probably see everything. Yeah. How great. It's fabulous. What makes it so great? Two things. I love my job and I love to travel. Mm -hmm. And I love to incorporate the two things together. Where did the, the whole idea come from? I mean, did someone say to you, hey, you need to do this? You love to travel. You love to teach and put it together. How did it come to you? It just came to me. I've always liked to travel. I've always liked to explore the world, different countries, different places. Um, I love to teach. I love art. Art is universal. Art, it's everywhere. Mm. And um, during the course of traveling, even just in my daily life, if I happen to see something that's inspiring for a lesson, you know, I think I'm always teaching, I'm always thinking about teaching. Did the same thing in India, right? Yes. Describe, when was that trip? That was in 2010. I went with the same organization. You came back and you said, I'm going to teach what? From the trip to India, I taught, um, we, I showed them um, f the Indian flag. Mm. I showed them pictures of elephants. I showed them the pictures that, um, of me riding the elephant. And um, this was with a first grade student. We did um, an image of a, an elephant on a flag and did it with, um, via a collage, which is cutting and gluing. First drawing, cutting, gluing, and putting the whole thing together. As I'm watching you do this, I'm thinking to myself, great teachers never stop learning. Yes. True. <laughs> Absolutely true. Absolutely true. It's dangerous if you think, <laughs> I mean, do you ever see, does it concern you that, I mean, obviously it's not going to happen to you, but the teachers we've had, the great educators, they, they just see themselves as constant learners. I mean, it's different ways that they go about it, but this is your way, isn't it? That's one of my ways, yes. I, um, I have a lot of different interests. I'm actually, um, um, I'm taking a workshop this weekend about um, learning about hor the spawning of horseshoe crabs and the migration of birds. Really? Yes. Will you bring that back into the classroom? I hope to. That's also a program for teachers, and that's through the New Jersey Conservation Society. Why is it so important that you bring ideas from, and experiences from around the world back into West Orange, into the classroom? Why, why do you think that's so important? Um, I feel that it's very important because I think a lot of these children may not get to these other places. Perhaps um, some of their ancestors are from some of these other countries and maybe they haven't been there. When I went to India and I returned, I put together a PowerPoint presentation, which I show to the students and it came out, I'm very happy with the results and the students love it. They eat it up, they have a million questions and they really feel almost as if they've been there. One to ten, how much you love your work? Ten. Definitely. Definitely. After you've taught for a few years now? Yes. Still ten? Still ten. Love my job. To keep traveling. I will. The kids are getting the benefit. I'm going to <laughs> Spain this summer. With you my, are? With my cousin, who is also a teacher. She teaches in California. And the two of us hope to come back and do a collaborative lesson together. I bet you will. Yes. Lisa Schustek. Yes. Our teacher. Redwood Elementary School in West Orange, New Jersey. I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you. This is why we do a series like this, Classroom Close-Up. Thank you. Stay right there. Don't, get, don't go. Sorry. What do you have, another trip you have to <laughs> no. take? No, no, no. You're in Patterson. <laughs> Stay in Patterson for two minutes, will okay. you? There are things to learn. Stay right there. Okay. We'll be right back right <laughs> after this. Where are you going? I don't know. I thought it was... If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. Elizabeth Denise, otherwise known as Chef Beth, is the director of the Culinary Arts Program at Burlington County College. Good to see you. Good to see you, Steve. Thank you for having me. Chef Beth, we like having you here. Um, tell folks about what's going on in your program. You run the uh, Culinary Arts Program down at Burlington County. This field of culinary arts and... Um, and, and this whole is, is exploding. Why? A few reasons, Steve. Number one, there's very many jobs available. 
one out of every 13 New Jerseyans works in hospitality somewhere. So we have five degree programs at BCC, culinary arts, baking and pastry, food service, hospitality management, and casino resort management. So graduates of our programs will be ready to work because as New Jersey rebuilds itself after the uh, superstorm, we think that there's going to be a lot of opportunities for our graduates in hospitality and culinary arts. Chef Beth, what's your story? I used to be a broadcast engineer, actually. So get out of here! Really? Mm -hmm. um, so I worked uh, for a couple of large, for networks and worked for Channel 12 for five years. Right. And I got tired of traveling on a satellite truck, so uh, <laughs> went back to the restaurant business. Uh, became a chef 13 years By ago. Well, you know, you're giving a lot of people around here ideas. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry about that. No, that's um, okay. We don't want to lose our really good people. But you said, "No, I'm done with this." I'm done. But did you always love? <laughs> The baking, cooking, what? I've always loved cooking. I've always loved to be in the kitchen. My dad owned a restaurant when I was a teenager, so... Um, Where'd you grow up? Uh, in Bergen County. Okay. So I actually was born in Patterson, so I'm Got from it. around here. Right where we do the show. Absolutely. So, so where did the, the opportunity for you to actually get into it professionally come from? I worked for an excellent chef in New York by the name of Brian Young at a uh, restaurant um, in New York City while I was also a broadcast engineer, so I worked as an engineer during the day and a cook at night. Wow. So... I uh, really enjoyed uh, the transition and was very lucky to work for some excellent chefs. How do you wind up down at Burlington? I they recruit you? Um, they did. I moved to Philadelphia in 2000 actually to work for Marriott and began teaching at, in about 2005 and uh, decided to uh, come out of the kitchen, out of the professional, um, out of the day-to-day -day kitchen and decided to be a full-time educator in uh, 2010. So. Describe for folks who may not understand why an academic institution, a community, a county college would be into this. What is the curriculum? We have, a, uh, we have an excellent culinary curriculum and baking one as well. What we try to do is give students the basics, basic knife skills, the mother sauces. <clears throat> we generally give them the tools to walk into any entry level position in any kitchen around the world. So what we do is we basically, if you think about culinary education as a house, we provide them the foundation. They take the foundation and then build their careers from what they've done at BCC. Where do they go? They get out of there. What happens to them? Our students have gone everywhere from the restaurant literally across the street from the culinary facility to Philadelphia. We had a student intern at Bon Appetit magazine. We have students at supermarkets. We have students at fine dining restaurants and nursing homes. And then we have them in the college cafeteria as well. We really try to get students where they would like to go. Let me ask, ask you, because we've been talking to people from the community and county colleges more and more. Do you see your role different, as a different role than a four-year institution in terms of what you're preparing students for? I mean, you really are preparing them for careers. We're really preparing them for careers. And one of the things that differentiate a two-year degree, say, from an institution like ours from a four-year institution is our students are prepared after two years of education to take that entry level management position. So if a student finishes our program with say two or three years of cooking experience, that person could go and then get a junior sous chef position. A what? A junior sous chef position or an entry level management position. Does the proximity to Atlantic City matter here? Absolutely. As being uh, with Atlantic City being one of the largest employers in the state, um, as you know, Ravel was built last year, right. opened employing 5,000 people. We think as the shore recovers as well and Atlantic City recovers as well that there'll be a lot of significant opportunity for students to, and not only work for large companies, but to open small restaurants of their own. Now, is there, my understanding is there's a restaurant um, right in the area down there. I mean, connect it to your facility. Talk about we that. We actually have a student-run restaurant that's Is, this, open. is it actually student-run, though? It's actually student-run. We have a back of the house instructor who's me, and we have a front of the house instructor who teaches front of the house fine dining service. Oh, explain, you're using language we don't know. What's back of the house? So back of the house means the uh, there's a kitchen operations class, so we have cooks and pastry pastry cooks, and then there's a maitre d instructor. Our maitre d instructor instructs students on fine dining in the front of the house or in the restaurant dining room itself. Okay. So help me understand this. Why are you in the back versus being out front? I'm a very hands-on person, and I really did not want to leave the kitchen. So I enjoy being in Chef's Whites. I enjoy cooking, and I really enjoy tr being with students and teaching students how to cook. So I'm in the kitchen with the students who are pre preparing the meals that are being served in the dining room by our students in the dining room service class. Is there actually a unique set of skills connected with being out front? There is. 
I think one of the, it's primarily people skills. If you're not good with people, you're going to find that working in the dining room is very difficult. One of the things that people don't understand is that being a waiter is a profession in every other country but ours. <laughs> Wait a minute. We in this country do not respect and appreciate the profession of being a waiter? Say not like it's appreciated in places like France or Italy. So I think that one of the things that we can do, as, and not only at BCC, but as culinary educators as a whole, is really provide some kind of career path for students who want to be waiters and want to be sommeliers and want to be restaurant managers. It's been almost a neglected art in the U.S. And by the way, sommeliers has to really have is to do... Is a wine steward. Yeah, but I, I was going to say that. They don't assume I don't know. I know these things. I was trying to show off, but you didn't oh, get a chance Steve, to do I didn't it. Mean to, uh. um, real quick, before I let you out of here, the physical setting of where you do it. There's, was it old farm? Uh, it's actually an old bank. The bank was old built. Bank, right? In, What's the name of the bank? The, it was the Farmers and Mechanics Bank, built the in 1815. Where is it? The Farmers and Mechanics Bank. Go ahead. Built in 1815. What makes the place so interesting? They left the entire outside <laughs> of the building. They have a vault in the middle of the dining room that's load bearing to the building wow. and can't be removed. It cannot. It cannot be removed because it's load bearing for the building. So Love. we have a beautiful vault in the middle of our dining room. That's what's going on down at Burlington County College. Come Chef visit us. F, director of the Culinary Arts Program down there. I want to thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Steve, very much for Good having stuff. me. Stay right there. One on one will continue right after this. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. Dr. Mark Connolly, Chairman of Surgery at St. Joseph's Regional Medical Center is with us. Good to see you, Doctor. Good to see you, Steve. I want to talk about um, certain minimally invasive surgeries, particularly when we talk about um, alternatives to heart surgery, open heart surgery. Um, who is a candidate for open heart surgery versus the alternative, and I believe the alternative, I'm calling it MIDCAB, which stands for M-I-D-C-A-B, stands for? Minimally Invasive Direct Coronary Bypass Grafting. So if a patient presents with blockages of his heart arteries, in right. other words, he has chest pain when he walks or plays tennis, and he's found to have blockages of his heart, ar uh, his heart arteries, there's different options, you know, and it really depends on how many blockages he has. If he only has a couple blockages, then he's a candidate for this minimally invasive direct coronary bypass grafting where we actually use the Da Vinci robot. The, the Da Vinci robot. Right. We're going to be showing some video of that and right. some uh, shots of it. What is the Da Vinci robot? Well, actually, it's a, it's a very highly sophisticated... We're actually looking at some video of it right now. It's, it's a highly sophisticated machine where you actually are able to put the physician, the surgeon's hands inside a body cavity. So, to, so what we do in this mid-cab procedure, someone presents with a blockage, usually with an artery on the top of their heart, and then we use the Da Vinci robot, putting actually our hands inside the patient, and we sit away at a console. So we're actually manipulating these robotic articulating arms inside the body, and we take an artery down underneath the breastbone. It's called the internal mammary artery, and we use that for one of the bypasses. So the patient only has three little tiny ports that are about the size of your baby mm -hmm. finger where we put these arms in in a very highly sophisticated 3D HD camera so we can actually really see what we're doing when we're dissecting. So we take this artery down and then after we, do, after we, after we use the robot, we take the robotic arms out and then we go ahead and make a little tiny three inch incision, or usually it's about two inch incision right underneath the nipple and we're able to kind of spread the ribs a little bit and the heart's right there. So we're able to take this artery and bypass the artery on the heart that has the blockage. So it's really a minimally invasive technique. Patients are usually have their breathing tube taken out in the operating room. They're usually sitting in a chair six to eight hours later they, and they end up going home in one to two days. Now a standard operation where, right. you, where you go through the breastbone the patient usually needs multiple bypasses. They have a lot of blockages. So you need more exposure. So you have to go through the breastbone. And it's a much more invasive procedure. The patient's usually in the hospital a little longer. So recovery longer. longer? The recovery's longer. The mid-cab patients go back to work sooner. They go back to their normal activities sooner. It takes about two months for this incision, the, the breastbone incision, to actually heal. So patients have about a, a two-month period where they really can't go back to work, particularly if they're a construction worker mm -hmm. or they do manual labor, because it takes time for that to heal. But doctor, not everyone is a candidate. I'm curious about this. Not everyone's a mm -hmm. candidate 
for the minimally invasive procedure, right? That's correct. Who would be the more likely candidate? Well, it's, it's a patient usually who has a blockage just on the artery on the top of his heart, but we're actually doing something. His with, or her. Yeah, his, his or her heart. And we're actually doing something called a hybrid procedure. You know, patients can also be candidates for stenting. You know, they don't right. need surgery. So we're actually putting kind of the best of both worlds together, the surgeons and the cardiologists to do the stenting. So let's say a patient has multiple blockages and then the artery on the top of the heart is a very difficult artery for the cardiologist to actually deal with with stenting. So we do the mid-cab procedure with the robot. The patient usually goes home for a week or two and then they come back and the other arteries mm -hmm. that they have blockages in, they actually get stenting. So in that procedure you go home the next day. So it's kind of getting the minimally invasive approach of uh, a best of both worlds really, I like to call it, between surgery and cardiology. Moving outside of the cardiac related uh, surgeries, what else can the da Vinci do? Well actually cardiac surgery is one of the, the lower volume procedures in the United States. What's the higher volume? The higher volume is prostat prostatic surgery, prostatectomies, and also partial nephrectomies where someone has a kidney tumor and they need part of their kidney removed. And one of the fastest growing is in GYN surgery, hysterectomies, myomectomies, you know, things that have to do with dealing with anything that's in the pelvis. And that's really growing substantially. Why is that? Um, it's just the progression of technology and the progression of surgeons kind of embracing the new technology and moving it into other areas. What I'm curious about is the training here. I mean, it's a fascinating to look at the visuals, you know, mm -hmm. and you look at the, 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 the mechanics of it, the technology, but the training of it, how does it take place? How long is it? How extensive is it? Talk about that. That's, that's a great question because there's actually been a recent lawsuit out in California. I heard about that. Right, where there's been some poor patient outcomes and they've actually been suing Intuitive, which is the Da Vinci robot company. At St. Joe's, we put a very kind of strict credentialing process in place. And uh, one of the, we just have our robot for about two and a half years. And fortunately, we were able to purchase what's called a dual console. So in other words, in, in the past, you just used to be able to have one surgeon, one console. Right. So we have a dual console. <clears throat> so when a, when a physician's learning, he can actually have a very experienced surgeon with him, just like he would when he's learning in a regular open operations when he's doing his residency training, helping him manipulate the arms, make sure that all the dissection's appropriate. And the other thing that we actually have is called a simulator. They develop these very sophisticated video type games where you're actually able to learn how to use the arms and use the robot without operating on a patient. And that technology has been around probably just about two years. So in the past, you used to kind of play around with the robot a little bit, maybe in a cadaver lab, and then eventually to patients. But uh, now we have these other facilities so that we can really have high quality surgery. For someone like yourself, given your position and your experience, what's it been like for you to see these advances? It's pretty incredible. It's actually very incredible. When I trained in heart surgery you know, many years ago, everything was completely open, big incisions. I mean, patients had good results, but it's major, major surgery. But now moving into smaller incisions, minimally invasive incisions, the patients are happier. There's less stress to the body. So the patients actually rec recover quicker and there's actually better outcomes. There's less bleeding, there's less wound infections. So the complications that you see with the major operations are actually less with these. And the patients are able to get back to work sooner, get back to their normal lives sooner, which is very, very gratifying. For people watching us right now in the couple minutes we have left, say they wanted to get more information. They wanted to also make the best decisions for themselves, you know, as to what's right for them. Obviously they have to consult their physician, their surgeon, but what about a lot of people go online and they just search Da Vinci, you know, or minimally invasive procedures? You can get good information, but isn't it, sometimes on the internet, it can be confusing. Yes. Does yeah. that concern you sometimes? It does, it does. And I encourage patients to go on the internet because it's a great source. And there's a lot of these websites are actually very developed. We have a robotic web, part of our website right. has robotic information for patients. Uh, but the more they learn and the more they know when they come and talk to you, the better informed they are. And if they get, get misinformation, you're usually able to handle that when you see them in the office. Uh, but it, there's a lot of information out, and Da Vinci has a very developed website, actually, uh, that has a lot of patient-focused questions and answers, and I would encourage people to go there. Before I let you out of here, 
Where do you think this is going in the next five to 10 years? Well, the other field that is going to probably grow, at least robotic surgery, is going to be in general surgery. General surgery. Which would be colon resections for cancer, for colon cancer, or removing a gallbladder for someone who has gallstones, and probably doing you know, more sophisticated surgery on the pancreas and things like that. So the technology is actually developing where they call it, a, it's called a single site. You know, when I mentioned to the mid-cap procedure, we had three holes for the ports and the camera. Now, now they have the technologies progressing where they make a little tiny incision right in the umbilicus and they're able to put the, the arms that we use to operate as well as the camera. So you can imagine, let's say, a, a young female who has a, a gallbladder that needs to be removed. The only incision that you'll see is in the umbilicus. So you won't really see any incisions. So it's a great advance, you know, particularly not just cosmetically, but you know, down the road as far as using more minimally invasive incisions. So the standard operation would be using a laparoscope. So she would have multiple well, incisions. A laparoscope real quick, which is? A, a laparoscope is basically kind of a, it's a scope with a camera on the end of it. And that's kind of one of the traditional ways that we kind of do these general surgery procedures. And it has a camera on the end of it, and then you kind of put your arm, you put these instruments through different ports, and you manipulate the instruments from the outside the patient, as opposed to the robot where you're manipulating the tissues and doing your surgery inside the patient. Did you ever think it would come to this? Never. <laughs> I, I never did. I mean, in my training, you know, it, it, never. Well, Dr. Mark Connolly, who is the chairman of surgery at St. Joseph's Regional Medical Center. I want to thank you for talking about not just what is happening, but what potentially could happen in the future. It's amazing stuff. Keep us posted, okay? Thank you. Thank you, doctor. That's great. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Wells Fargo, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, the New Jersey Education Association, New Jersey Council of County Colleges, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, PSENG, and by Verizon Communications. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. New Jersey is a leader in solar power, and PSE&G is doing its part. With 24 solar installations in New Jersey, projects that are giving landfills new purpose and turning former brownfields green, solar powers more than our homes and schools and businesses. It powers our economy by creating jobs right here in the Garden State. PSE&G, proud to support New Jersey.